You hear me? Yeah, perfect. So my name is Johan Sommerfeld. Today I'll be talking about Python and Erlang and how we can combine those. So a quiz question, how many people know Erlang in here? And how many people do know Python? Nice. And how many people use Python and Erlang? Yeah, a few. And con the last question, concurrently. <laughs> yeah, awesome. I'm special. So, why Python? Um, I started using Python in 2008. I worked as, uh, with Operation as a sysadmin. Um, I, needed, I needed automation. I like automation. Uh, and when my script catalog filled with more than 150 shell scripts, it was time for change. And when that was done, uh, I was supposed to uh, lead the development of an automation uh, auto-deploy tool, uh, because in 2008 we didn't have Ansible and Puppet and Chefs and things like that. Uh, and with that we used Django, uh, which doesn't have on the homepage now, but then it had like the perfect slogan for perf uh, perfectionist with deadlines. I love that one. So Python is quite generic. It allows you to uh, develop in both object and uh, oriented way, or you can do it functional, although I think it's quite biased towards object oriented. Um, we have the PEP20, the Zen of Python, the ones that know Python most likely knows this one. Um, although it's the Zen of Python, I generally think it, it holds true to quite a lot of development. Beautiful is better than ugly, explicit is better than implicit, simple is better than complex, etc. Et and this is actually not all of them. You have some more. But this, I think, is the basis for a good design. So even, um, even though I'm not always in Python programming, I generally I adhere to the sun of Python. The community of Python is, is really big. Um, it's been around for quite some time, not as long as Erlang, but it has seen a significant amount of adoption. We have Google, Facebook, Instagram, Dropbox. Uh, if you look on PyPP, uh, the like, de facto standard for package installation, you have over 170,000 packages. But that wasn't enough. so. How come I, I ended up with Erlang? And that wasn't like in the 80s when it was developed. It was just a few years ago. Um, so we were a Python shop, uh, and we were developing this huge system. Uh, and Python really doesn't do that good uh, in its own. So you have cool libraries built on top of that. One of the most significant ones is Celery, which uh, by default wants to use RabbitMQ. Uh, as the messaging queue to generate or fake distribution within Python. Um, you do this by some decorators and some other functions that you build on top on your Python code, so it gets distributed. Uh, it works quite good, but when you start poking in it and you want to start fiddle really, really much with the queuing systems, uh, it gets a bit, bit dense. Uh, and then we started to work with React and with that, you start going into Erlang. Uh, and when you start looking at that, you, could, um, you can see that it, there's a lot of things that are really similar between the two languages. Uh, they adhere to, to like concepts that are quite alike, even though the languages are really, really different. And also, I needed to build a custom FTP server for an IoT uh, company. And that's very, very much better in Erlang rather than doing it in Python. I assure you, I did both to test. So back in the 80s, uh, when the good people at Ericsson uh, needed something else, they had that. <coughs> they had these challenges. Uh, they uh, wanted actions to be performed within reasonable time. Uh, system that could be distributed over several computers. Systems that should be always on. We n they needed continuous delivery. Uh, maintenance during uptime, that sort of thing. Um, they wanted to handle the fact that hardware and software will fail, and um, that system will become extremely large and complex. Um, and I think this is quite impressive, because this was 
done because there was no language like this. So they built Erlang and this was in the 80s. And quite a lot of these are hype words today that we're trying to solve in other languages, which was done in the 80s. So that's, um, yeah, penny for thought, something like that. Uh, so what came out of Erl uh, when Erlang came? So we have this magic, the, the buzzword that probably you hear most when you hear Erlang, the nine nines. Uh, I think it was a base system, if I'm not mistaken, that has 99.9999% nine 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 of availability over several years. And that's like milliseconds of downtime over a big period of time. Uh, it's really productive. Once you get used to the syntax, it really helps you build distributed systems. Uh, and with some of the things that you have um, within Erlang, such as non-immutability uh, uh, and things like that, uh, and you have tail recursibility, and once you get used to it, uh, it it's really, really helps you uh, build a system really, really fast, or prototypes really, really fast. So some of the limitations uh, of Erlang, uh, most of them actually I think are quite subjective and up to our debate. Uh, so generate soft uh, real time, so you can end up with tight loops that doesn't perform as well as other languages. Uh, this was a limitation that was known already when the design was made. That's why Erlang is so easy to implement with other languages. It's really a huge amount of, of allowance to fork out into other parts, or other code code bases, uh, or if you want to, you can build um, C functions within Erlang. And with the new release, I think it was 20, you have uh, dirty schedulers as well, so this is even more robust today. Um, you have quite a lot of boilerplate code uh, when you're doing gen servers uh, and things like that, um, although I think that ends up for quite readable code, so honestly, I don't think that's uh, a bad thing. Then we have security. With Erlang generally being a distributed system, the communication in between is quite open and you don't have any, that many levels of security. Um, but that and then again, if you have too much security and something fails, you generally have a hard time going in and fixing it. So I would argue that traceability would be preferable rather than, than limiting things uh, in distribution layer. But Some of the uh, enterprises that uses um, Erlang, it's Ericsson, of course, they made it. Uh, Klarna, which we're at today. Uh, Bet365 is quite a big thing. Uh, WhatsApp, you have that one before. Um, and if you look at the community, you have 4,900 packages on Hex, which is like the up-and-coming package manager of Erlang, which is a bit short of 170,000, I think. So um, we've got a bit, some way to go. So we were a Python shop, uh, started using Erlang. Um, quite soon, I, s I started seeing quite a lot of similarities. There was no really, there wasn't that hard jumping in between uh, Python and Erlang, although you, I, I have a lot of dots at the end of my Python code that shouldn't be there now. But yeah, um, development speed is quite rapid. You can get things up and running quite fast, both with Python and Erlang. Um, don't do premature optimization. It's a bit with the soft real-time thing. You, you, you respect the concepts more tha than trying to build something really, really, really fast in the beginning. Because generally, it's not going to be where you think the problem is. That's not where it's going to be. So tight loops generally ends up somewhere else than you thought. Uh, and both Erlang and Python gives you tremendous possibility to trace uh, and profile your code. And then you can go in and fix the problem where it actually is, when it, when it shows up. Uh, both Erlang and Python have tremendous ch interactive shells to work with. Uh, for example, IPython, which is uh, the, the one I'm, I'm using when, when developing Python. Um, has made so I almost don't know how to debug Python, and I'm all I'm up into a decade of Python programming now. Um, and that's generally because it's so transparent. So when you're developing, you can, you can just step through and you can look. It hides nothing. So you can always get, a, get an update and you can look at the state at it. 
uh, and you can try to figure out what's, what you've been doing wrong. Um, when you're done developing and you deploy to production, that's ends though, because then, then it's harder to maintain. So you, I generally have tons of logging that I can tune for when I have problems in production. Uh, and that's where Erlang, the Erlang shell really, really shines, because you develop and you have the Erlang shell and you look at it, and you have all this instrumentation, you look at the state, you look at things, you make calls so you can get, uh, you can look at the, the queue lengths and, and things like that. And then when you put it in production, it's still there. Since it's asynchronous, you can jump in with a, to a remote shell and you're actually in the production system. You can look and you can trace actual flow of the running system without re needing to restart or anything. And, and for me, that was like, yeah, I got goosebumps when I understand what I would be able to do with that uh, as an ops guy. And, uh, and with DevOps being so, so in the hype right now, like every other tech thing you get on LinkedIn, it's like, yeah, DevOps, awesome. And Erlang is really, really, really good for that since if you're developing something, you know the code, right? And being able to have the same instrumentation that you have locally in the production system is, is really, really helpful for, for finding things when, when it's burning. And it will burn, it always does. So, enter Purelang. So as I said, I'm actually using in, in a few uh, projects, uh, Python and Erlang, uh, coherently. There exists, since Erlang is so good at, at interacting with other ones, it's actually not that hard to get something up and running and actually using Python and Erlang at the same time. Um, but it was some boilerplate code, um, and I didn't like the ones the version I wrote was way too biased towards the problem, the specific problem I was was solving at the time, uh, and that was that was when I uh, got in touch with Erlang Solutions. Uh, so I pitched my idea, uh, and uh, fortunately I, I said something right because they liked it. Uh, so they helped build a first version of of Purelang, uh, which is a name pending because. We, we sat down and we talked about it, and we had pure lang, and in Swedish that's really, really funny with the smoldering thing that never dies, you can't put it out, things like that, and we had a laugh. Um, but then we said, yeah, it, al it already exists, so that was a bit of a bummer. Um, although it is, that's a bit, a bit stale, so we have the working name pure lang. Although that is a bit misleading, because what we are trying to solve with pure lang isn't a new language. We don't want to take uh, any shortcuts. We want to, to, to merge the communities and we want to be able to use uh, Erlang where, where it shines and we want to use Python where it shines and generally that union becomes a really, really big set. So if you have Erlang and Python you can do really, really cool stuff. Um, but we don't want to take shortcuts. We don't want to write Erlang in Python syntax and we don't want to write Python within Erlang syntax. Generally, I think the people made, that made Python and Erlang are really, really smart people because they are both tremendous languages. And the syntax that it shows adhere to the problems that you're trying to solve in that language. So it's, it's, it's great with, with all these meta programming things that come up. Like, yeah, you can write Python in, uh, um, in Ruby, or you can write it in Python. There exists something that is actually quite close to Python. But that, that's something else. What we're trying to do is just use the libraries that exist because I think that is just because we're afraid of going out of a comfort zone. If you actually give the time, if you know Python and you give it time to learn, look at Erlang and see of the, the problems that you can solve with that, you're going to see that the syntax actually works really well with the problems that you're solving uh, in, in Erlang. And the same goes the other way around when looking at uh, numeric analysis and, and, and machine learning and, and string manipulation and things like that. Python syntax works really, really well for that. So try going out of your comfort zone looking at them and, and after a while it's going to be really... I, I, for me actually it was really, really easy because I think the syntax works really well for the problems that you're solving. Um, and with uh, Peerline we want to lessen the glue code. So we want to make the boilerplate so that you can... You have Erlang, you have Python, uh, pure, the core part of Purelang is actually just a library in, uh, in Python, and then you should be up and running. So the, uh, as I said, the core of Purelang uh, 
is right now a, a Python library. Uh, the reason for that is because, um, as we've said several times, Erlang is really, really good at interacting with other languages. Uh, and it has a really solid foundation for building a distributed system. Uh, so what we did in the, in the core of PureLang is we implemented distributed Erlang within Python. Um, so we implemented a, a, a Python object which behaves uh, as an Erlang process with a message inbox, uh, stuff like that. And then we implemented the Erlang uh, external term format. Uh, so that uh, that's uh, the binary format that Erlang uses when it, it, uh, it shuffles data between the nodes. Uh, we have the distributed Erlang part with the EAPMD connection, links, or links over distribution uh, and such. Uh, and within Python, we're currently, currently using givent for the event loop because it needs to, we need to give EPMD and things like that uh, some, some working time so it can interact with, uh, with the distributed Erlang. Uh, the reason for using givent is that we're, we haven't decided we're going to go for Python 3 and Python 2 yet, but uh, using givent, we have that option. So this is uh, just my crazy ideas that's coming. Uh, we haven't implemented this yet. So when, when you want to call in in, uh, in Erlang, if you want to call and, and execute a function on a different node, it's quite, quite straightforward. You have the RPC and you make a call. Uh, you define the node that you want to make the call on. You have the model, you have the function, and then you have the arguments, since Erlang is using uh, just argument, uh, positional arguments. Um, Python being quite generic and you can use functional programming, it's not that hard to, to do similar ca calling um, within Python if you want to call an Erlang node. Uh, it's quite straightforward. Um, me and Dima, we are um, debating if this fits for Python as well. I don't think so, he thinks so. Um, so generally what I want to do is I want to lift it up because I think that uh, looking at an object path uh, towards Python is is better than using module function because we have nested namespaces and we have methods and class methods and just pure functions and in Python everything is an object so a function is just just an object that's callable a class method is just a fun an object on an object which has which is callable uh, so having node object path arguments and then keyword arguments, I think, adhere better to the way that you're calling Python functions. And I still think this is quite, quite in the terms of, of Erlang syntax, although we're moving a bit towards the, the, the Python design of it. And another problem is that we're going to have, when we start using Python code, we're going to have native Python objects, which is hard to make into an Erlang uh, an, an Erlang object. And what we could do then is we could pickle it, or we could pack it, or we could do something with that. But generally what we're doing is, if you have a Python object, you're not going to be able to use that within the Erlang node. We just want to be able to reference it so we can call other parts of Python and use it. Um, so with that, I have the idea that we're going to have, which is going to act like a, a process on low level. But you'll be able to generate a context. And when you do that context, you can then call Python. And instead of using a node, you use the context. And then you have the object path, the arguments, and keyword. And what you're getting back then is you're getting back a reference of a Python object or a variable or something, which still lives within the Python node. So it hasn't left the, the context. So you, this context li lives now on one Python node. And all variables are still there. Uh, we just get back a reference. And then you can use that reference to call other Python functions within the same context. And we're going we're gonna to then fetch the Python object um, Within, within the Python node uh, when you're calling it. So what, what did you say? Code is document, self-documenting, right? So for an example, the daytime object, that's a, a, a Python native object that you don't have much use of that in the, in the Erlang node. So the, in this one, it's, it's relatively simple then. You create a context on the first row, and then you import the daytime module. Uh, that's with this import 
So now we're a bit, now we're both in, in Erlang syntax, but Python specific parts. Um, so that's the path. And this is the argument that you push in. So you want to import the daytime uh, module. And it re we get that reference back as DT. Or we assign it to D. The reference, we assign that to DT. And now we want now one. So we use the path here, which be which becomes a list then. First we have DT, which is then daytime. And then we have the binary, which is daytime, which is the object. And now, which is the class met method that, that exists on the object daytime. Uh, no arguments, no keyword arguments. And now we get now one back, which is also reference. So now we have now one manifested within the Python node. Uh, now we call now two. Uh, and we do it a bit different just to showcase that we could build the path from different parts. So it's DT, and then we have the atom, daytime, and then the binary now. So now we have now one and now two. And uh, for those that doesn't know, if you don't want to do now minus now two minus now one, you can do now two dot underscore underscore sub underscore underscore, uh, and then now one as argument, which works exactly the same as doing a subtraction, and we get the result. And then we finish off by getting the total seconds back. And that is just a float, right? Which we can turn into an Erlang format. So at that point, we, we just return uh, the float value. Another in interesting idea is lazy evaluation. So we could do these parts uh, without a context. So we do the DT import. Uh, we do now one and now two. These are just references of things to do. We haven't done anything. We haven't left the Erlang node yet. We have just built something that needs to be done. Uh, and then we create three contexts, uh, three contexts, C1 to C3. Um, and then we do a list comprehension, uh, calling all the uh, contexts uh, with uh, the result. And this will then make all the commands run on each context. Um, if I would have more time, I could have done that asynchronously. So uh, it would have run concurrently as well. So that is for the, the glue code. And um, future projects, uh, one of the most interesting things I see, which is probably most likely one of the things I'm going to use, uh, is a VSGI server or gateway uh, with Web 2.0 coming up more and more, uh, and having long polling sessions open. Uh, you can do that, but, but as I said, we have Givent and things like that, but that's not as native and as pretty as asynchronous things works in, in Erlang. So having uh, a web server which can handle tons of connections open, um, and then just fire into Python, for example, if you have a Django project, you can have a thousands of connections towards Erlang. And then when something actually happens, then you fall off and you call one of your uh, pools of, of Django servers that are available. Um, machine learning, distributed machine learning, or actually distributed anything. Um, if you look at TensorFlow, for example, it has some form of, of distribution built into it. But th it's the same thing again. You're building distribution on top of Python. And generally, I, Python is not that good at, at distribution and multiprocessing. Uh, instead, I would see this. Uh, I would think it would be really cool. I think it would work really, really well, having a core system of of Erlang which handles all the all the polling, all the all the distribution of, of work, and then having Python nodes uh, doing the number crunching. And what else? That's up to you. So the unicorn with Python and Erlang, maybe we could get a build system with. Tremendous uptime and ready for big data and being distributed and DevOps and Unicode and protocol making and math, machine learning and a huge community. And yeah, I'm running out of buzzwords, but with the communities together, I think it, it, it could really benefit both communities. And uh, if we give it time, I don't think it's it, the, the speed bump won't be that much because the, the uh, the feel of the communities and, and the things that matter to the communities, I actually think, are quite similar. It's just that syntax and things like that are a bit different. So, questions? I sp 
speed it through a bit because I'm hoping for lots and lots of questions. Yeah. So, who has the cube? Anyway, first, thank you very much, Yuan. Thank you. Uh, Robert, do you have it? So, who's going to have the first question? All the way down here. Terrible throwing. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, first of all, thank you for your talk. And uh, I have already checked the code some time ago, and uh, the whole idea uh, seems really nice, especially comparing to something like our own interface or EI, which is like, yeah. Uh, but I've got a question. So, what use cases did you did you have in mind? when he was developing this application because, well, from my point of view, there are not so many cases when you want something to be pretending as a Erlang node. I mean, you you, uh, you already have a possibility to interact with Python code. You just have an Erlang node, you just communicate with ports, or you do whatever stuff you need. Like, I don't know, REST interfaces, other protocols. So, like, what is the reasoning behind of, of having Python as an Erlang node? behaving as an adult no? yes, so The main idea is tightening the loop, uh, generally. So, so uh, the project that I made, where, where I implemented this, uh, was uh, a huge data um, analysis tool where we should report tons and tons, of, like several gigabytes of data. Uh, and we have this and we ha we're using, um, we have data within React and pulling it out. And so what we what we saw that to be able to do huge aggregations, we wanted to be able to take small parts of data out, fold it, and and then throw it away. So we would be result bound rather than input bound. That was like the main application where I started doing this, and I actually implemented it fully within Python. Um, and the big issue being there that it was really, really unstable. So having five, six, seven processes and trying to coordinate them within Python, it's, it's a hassle. So it's, yeah, that's really, really hard. Um, and then, yeah, you look and you could do URL ports and things, but that, that's quite a lot of glue code to actually get it up and running well. Uh, and it wasn't that, that fast, I thought anyway. Uh, and then I find w uh, found uh, Basho's uh, with Basho's time series, they developed the binary term format, um, which was pure Python, I think, uh, which was really really slow. And then we, I found, I think, is or less stick. Yeah. Anyway, it's a it's a, a binary format within in Python, uh, which compiles into C. So it's Cython or something. I think they've written it in. Uh, so with then uh, uh, I created, so I had Erlang nodes, which then called straight down towards uh, standard out or what it uses uh, when you're using Erlport. port. Um, but with that, it was still a bit of a hassle, I think, uh, with that. Of course, it worked, uh, and that's the, uh, that's the impressive part, right? It, it still works uh, quite well, but you have those three, four hundred lines of code to get that up and running, and you have that you need to do some things in Python and some things in Erlang. And for every project, you need to do that over and over again. So my idea with Peterlang is that we, and that's why we did it from scratch. So Dima has, done, has tremendous knowledge about the distribution, distributed Erlang. Uh, and with that, we could then do a, a slim functionality within Python. And then now we're looking at, at implementing the uh, term format uh, within C. So, so it's really, really fast. Um, I made some uh, looks, and you're actually up to par with JSON packing uh, with it. Uh, so, so it's it's really really fast. Uh, and with then, then you can you can lessen, so you can actually call Python functions really really fast uh, from within within Erlang. Uh, and I would say, on the other hand, you have when you get that possibility, you have tons of, of, of uh, um, c uh, projects within Python that you could use uh, when in Erlang. So honestly, I think the biggest benefit would be when you have Erlang and you want to, to talk to things within Python. And if Python then can speak Erlang, that would probably lessen the glue code that you need. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Um, 
just if if Erlang thinks that the Python thing's Erlang, it could send it really big and nasty, complicated Erlang data structures with huge big numbers in and all kind of things. So do you have to be a little bit careful that, that you, you don't confuse the Python nodes by sending them things they don't really understand? Or, or oh. do they understand big nums and everything? I mean, if I send a, a, I a megabyte big num in a crypto system from Erlang to Python, On I, I th what would happen? I'm not sure, honestly. Because I think you might get a kind of mismatch that you have yeah. to do an awful lot of data conversion. Yeah, but the good thing, with, if you make it behave like Erlang, failure is an option, right? So you just implement it. Yeah, but Erlang doesn't fail when you add two numbers together. But no, no, but Python would have to fail but if, the, the, if, the if call, you But the call the would fail. So if we implement it right, so we know that, okay, so this is a rogue file. That we can implement that really, f really early within the call, and we can just fail. Because, I mean, you sort of asked that question. Um, I was kind of thinking, why bother? You know, because you could send JSON over HTTP or something and it's just done in 10 minutes. And it's, it's easy both in Erlang and in Python, so. But if so, how come few, so few be? I was the only one using both at the same time and I think that they are tremendous together. Uh, so my belief is that it <laughs> is actually a problem. Otherwise, more people would do it. I think it's well, I don't know, but it's probably because people don't program in both Python and Erlang. <laughs> so, so if they knew both languages. I mean, you've got sockets, and, and you've got Erlang, and you've got Python. If they speak sockets, that's it. Just yeah. use XML or JSON. Use XML or JSON or whatever you feel like. It doesn't really matter. <laughs> it's just data. Yeah. Uh, but so you, add, you add more complexity with it, uh, between then. So, uh, and that's the point. Uh, that... If you're losing, yeah, it's soccer, but then you need every time you need to do that. So let's say, okay, so let's build a REST API, but why, when you could, with a few lines of code, just have every, all that set up? Oh, no, because you've got all the code working. And also, people have heavily optimized all, all that JSON and HTTP stuff is sometimes done in hardware without you even knowing, and it's heavily optimized. So, so trying to beat that can be very difficult sometimes. TCP stacks and things like that are in, done in the chips in the, in the hardware interfaces. And, and all sorts of magic happens if you if you send these things. Yeah, but distribute Erlang is sockets, right? Yeah, yeah, but well, we could talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, using sockets anyway, but you don't know it. I mean, even. Anybody else have a question? Yes, <laughs> Okay. Uh, can you go back to your uh, code slides? Uh, I ha I'm desperately curious. So what is the last uh, parameter there that you pass uh, when you do the call? Uh, that oh, one? Yeah, that one. So it's a keyword argument. So in, in Python, you don't have just positional arguments. You have both positional arguments and named arguments. Uh, and generally, when programming Python, you, you, you have, if you're doing metaprogramming, you have an array, which is the positional arguments. And then you have a dictionary, which is almost identical uh, to a map within Erlang. Um, so that's why I used, uh, used a map. So, so in that, you could call, um, if you're using daytime purely, you would, could have year, month, day named here, instead of having them in a specific position uh, in the arguments list. Yeah, yeah, GitHub link, sorry. That was my bad. Oh, no internet connection, <laughs> of course. I'm in flight mode as well, so. But you have the link there in a way, right? More questions? Okay, thank you, Yuan. The discussion has begun, and we can continue the discussion out. Uh, have a break have uh, some more drinks. I think they've brought harder drinks than soft drinks now. If not now, they'll be coming later. So we'll be come back in 10, 15 minutes, okay? Thanks so much.